I'll come back to why the dog's important in a moment. Does anybody not know what, who IBM is? Yeah, okay, thank you very much, yeah. Well, uh, uh, 10 years ago, I don't think we'd have been a problem, but now it probably is, because we don't make laptops anymore, we don't make computers anymore that people see on a day-to-day -day basis. But we're a big enterprise technology company, we do a lot of security stuff. Um, we've got about a quarter of a million people uh, working for us around the world. And we are number one in a whole variety of number of areas, including patents. You know, we filed more patents last year um, than anybody else for the 29th consecutive year. And I've been in IBM for slightly longer than that, which is a bit scary. And I've been around in IBM since the 90s, um, which is when we made the largest ever um, corporate loss in, in, in human history. Um, uh, but it's been fun since then. And some of the things, I guess, up there from a, from a security point of view that may be of interest. Um, I engineered a national identity card system. Um, and, um, and we actually found uh, significant numbers of terrorists as a result of that by fusing the identities. That was interesting. Um, I also was responsible for um, uh, a new capability. Um, to enable um, some of our um, organizations in the UK um, to work low side um, on the cloud so they can do fast development on Amazon or Azure or, or IBM cloud um, and then actually uh, escalate those uh, capabilities to the high side and do that in an efficient manner. So um, it's been an interesting kind of ride and I find myself over here now in a cloud architect role, um, actually trying to build robust capabilities, regulatory clouds for the banks to start moving their sensitive data to the cloud. It may feel like the cloud is everywhere these days, but in fact, in the highly regulated space, it's almost nowhere. You know, systems engagement have gone across 20% of the systems, that's about it. So I'm working with, you know, FIPS 140, uh, two level four kind of, HSMs, tying those into confidential enclaves where, you know, it's not just the, uh, the disk and the, uh, uh, and the keys that are encrypted, but it's also the, uh, the memory itself and, and the like. And, and the reason the dog's important is because the dog keeps me grounded, okay? It's when you get to being a chief architect or a CTO or some of these wonderful titles, it's so easy to lose track of technology. And I was listening to some of the talks just before this one, and I was thinking, I, I actually know how to do that. And the only reason I know how to do that is because of the work on the dog. Um, and my robot dog is, is right from day one on, in, back in 2017, was able to follow me around. He followed me around because I held an ultrasonic screwdriver, okay? And then the ultrasonic receivers here would actually pick up where it was, fit it into a neural net in a JavaScript microcontroller called an Esperino, um, and that would then allow him to follow me. So I trained him, I literally trained him to follow me. Um, he had a microphone nose so you could talk to him um, and he had rotating LIDAR on his ears. These, the, the whole point of this dog, by the way, is also to go into schools and universities and various other places and show him off. Um, he has to be built out of commodity parts. So I've got a self-written rule. Every bit has to be less than 100 pounds. Okay, otherwise I'm not allowed to use it. So I'm not allowed to use technology to create a real robot dog. I have to use my ingenuity and wit to try and do it instead. So revolving LIDARs on the ears with the servos that are hidden underneath his head allowed him to scan what was in front of him and do some basic collision detection. And, oops. And today, he's a little bit more sophisticated as the technology's got cheaper in the intervening five years. We've now got face recognition built into the Raspberry Pi high-quality camera. I'm using a Coral, a Coral TPU from, from, from Google. Um, I've got a three-dimensional camera um, generating information on the front there. Um, so that partially replaces the LiDAR revolving ears, but it's a bit more sophisticated than that. Uh, and I've also got, I've replaced the phone charging point that was on the back uh, now with a, with a 360 LiDAR, because actually that's now less than 100 pounds too. So he's gone from being relatively sophisticated, I think, to being quite sophisticated, but he still runs on a Raspberry Pi with all these little microcontrollers. Um, 
And this is the thing I've been most proud of recently, is you know, this is the kind of thing that the depth camera will produce when it's looking forward. Um, you'd be hard pushed even as a human, I think, to spot the fact there are three tin trays that he needs to avoid on the floor. Um, this is after I, I wrote my own um, uh, point cloud algorithms so that basically we can now see there are three tins on the floor that he needs to avoid. And it's doing that at 10 frames a second on a single, uh, single processor on a Raspberry Pi. So I've got another three processors to play with. And, and that kind of stuff is, is, is important because it keeps me grounded when I'm doing all this other stuff for IBM um, and keeps me up to date. Uh, and again, you know, you, many of you are at the beginning of your careers. I would certainly recommend finding companies that will take techies and keep them as techies until they become executives, which is what IBM does, you know, where the distinguished engineers and fellows in IBM are full executives, um, but we... Uh, but we're allowed to stay technical and, and do stay technical. So the bulk of the talk today is not about robot dogs. It's about the future of computing and in particular qubits. But I want to actually make sure we touch on all the different aspects of where we're going because we've got bits, we're about to have qubits, and we're really going to change the way that neurons work in the near future too. And I think that's going to usher in an entirely new era of a new kinds of scientific discovery. And by goodness, we need it. And we'll go through that in a second. Let's start with neurons first. Um, I mean, the machine learning today, we've identified in the work that we've done, I used to be the European CTO for, um, for our cognitive services. Um, and, you know, I was involved in huge numbers of customer projects as a result. And this, this sentence is deliberately overloaded, okay? But it's AIs are only as good as the data we train them on. Yes, we spend 80% of our time actually cleaning the data before we can use them. But also, there are about 180 biases we've identified in data so far and built statistical techniques to be able to deal with them. So, you know, please, when, as you move into the next phase of, of cyber, you know, and, and, and machine learning models get more and more important, just bear that statement in mind. It's really important. IBM has been involved in artificial intelligence and machine learning right from the start. Well, not quite from the start. Um, you know, we weren't quite involved in it at this stage. Um, I mean, it, people don't realize that there were actually robots around in the 1940s. Um, uh, the guy who in uh, Walter Gray Walter, what, Gray Walter? Yeah, Walter Gray Walter, um, who invented the, who had discovered the sleep patterns of humans, you know, um, actually created two robots called Elmer and Elsie, I think they were called, they were built on vacuum tubes, um, took in light, amplified it through the vacuum tube, got it, to the, got it to, the, to, the, to, the, to the motors, and allowed them to chase each other around the floor in the 1940s. Um, but AI wasn't really born until 1956 um, at the Dartmouth Conference. Um, and the reason I'm telling you this story about, uh, about the history, I think it will, will come apparent as I go through it, because basically that story has been a story, it's unusual in technology terms, of these winters, you know, where basically nothing much happened. Now, my hypothesis, when you look at that, what's actually going on in these stages, is that we actually hit technology dead ends. We stopped making progress. We couldn't make commercial use of the technology we had, um, simply because the actual power of the computers weren't able to actually uh, keep up with um, the problems that we were setting in, in the real world. And that very first conference, uh, people realized, well, people, they, you know, know the people like John McCarthy and Marv Minsky and Claude Shannon were there. They probably don't know there were three IBMers there, actually, at the same conference. And Nathaniel Rochester was actually one of the ones who organized the conference in the first place. You can see the wonderful hubris of man, and I do mean M-A-N, man, by saying that basically we think within six months over the summer we can crack this. Well done. I mean, there were some big, big braves there, but I think that was still a bit of a slight overcall. Um, but, you know, the kind of people that were here are quite extraordinary. So, uh, Tenshard Moore invented a, a program language called APL. Um, APL is the only language written in Greek, literally written in Greek, um, using Greek characters. Uh, if you want to use it, you have to build your own keyboard these days. Um, Nathaniel Rochester, um, he invented and was the main brains behind the IBM 701, which was the world's first commercial computer, entirely you know, built around valves and everything else, but the world's first commercial computer. If you've ever heard the Thomas J. Watson quote, when everybody laughs and says there's a market out there for five computers in the world, ha, 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 that's actually a misquote. 
what he was actually saying was only five computers can be afforded. You know, there was only five companies in the world that could potentially afford the computers they were selling back then. He was wrong. We sold 11. Um, but, the, but my hero, on the, oh, well, oh well, by the way, Nathaniel Rochester also invented the first symbolic assembler. Huh. Um, this bloke over here, though, completely unsung hero, uh, Arthur Samuel, what he did was he invented, well, he, would, he did one of the first implementations of the hash table, yeah? But also, hard to believe, I know, but basically, Bar Minsky, who came up with the idea of the neural net, worked with this lot, and actually, the year after this conference, we ran the very first neural net in 1957. <laughs> so, nothing new under the sun. Arthur Samuel um, invented a checkers playing program, drafts. Um, when it was announced that we had a drafts playing program, IBM stock price went up 15% overnight. Wish it would do that these days. Um, but fundamentally, Arthur Samuel invented a whole bunch of things which you're gonna hear about again in a few seconds. He invented the, the, uh, the alpha beta pruning tree. You know, how you, how you get things, computers to play games. The min-max strategy to enable them um, to win. Um, he also invented something called rote learning, um, where basically he realized he couldn't get the parameters quite right for the weighting for the various different positions on the board and how much a king was worth and how much a, 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 a piece was worth when it was two off the end um, piece before it gets promoted. So he actually used rote learning to tune the algorithms that were actually used to tune uh, how much pieces were, wor were worth and evaluating the position of the overall board. And he obviously fed in the, 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 the information from the, from the best games around. Which then gives you to Deep Blue. And Deep Blue is interesting because basically it's got this reputation that it beat Kasparov because of brute force. And to some degree that is actually true. But it's not the whole story. Actually, again, all those algorithms and all the weightings in the algorithms and all the scores at the different stages of the different were entirely learned from human grandmaster games. So what the reason that Deep Blue came about when it came about in 1997 was because we then had mainframe kind of technology for Unix. So we just invented sort of big multiprocessor Unix systems. So again, the big steps in machine learning come about because of the big steps in, 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 in technology advancement. Um, Stanley, the DARPA channel, challenge, um, not that well known, but Stanley drove uh, 172 miles, I think, through the desert, something like that, um, with only waypoints every, every 50 to 70 meters. There were GPS waypoints. Um, He's got exactly the same architecture as my robot, um, funny that. Um, all robots have virtually the same architecture, I find, because um, we're trying to solve very similar problems. But again, when they tried to get Stanley to drive, they couldn't actually come up with the algorithms to get Stanley to drive, so they had to put a driver in the car, get all this data to be absorbed and fed in, so they could actually generate the machine learning model, which would then eventually drive the car, because it was aping how a human drove it, because there was no way of actually building the algorithms. Again, that was only possible because the technology had gone another step in terms of what we could do with portable technology. And then you get to Watson and Jeopardy. Jeopardy, big quiz game in the States. Watson won against the best human competitors of, every, any, of any all time. And basically, that's a standalone computer. Okay, so it was working by itself. And the reason it worked and, and won was because it was able to, to sort out clues like this. What's the answer to this clue? Go on, someone shout out, someone be brave. No. Yeah, what is the TARDIS? If you put that into Google, it will not appear in, as TARDIS. TARDIS will not appear on the first page or the second page of the results. That's why Watson and Google are different. Google uses you know, higher dimension algorithms and Hilbert spaces to find correlations between the phrases and, and the documents that you're looking for. This actually dissects the meaning of the sentence into those various different bits. So British TV icons, know where I'm looking. Time machine, right, that's the answer, it's a time machine. First appeared, oh, whack, I'm gonna have to do some maths um, around dates. The day after, definitely having to do some dates. JFK was shot, JFK was shot 22nd November 1963. Um, not 23rd, what happened on then? Oh yeah, Doctor Who started. What was the name of the time machine? The TARDIS. So what, you know, Watson gets that one right. 
The only reason that we're not using Watson as the world search engine is because to do that, you need an entire dedicated supercomputer um, that only works uh, over the cloud. Um, you know, you can see there 3,000 processor threads, 16 terabytes of RAM, and the latest technologies that were available at those times, Sparkle and Hadoop, um, which may seem old hat these days, and a bit are, but, um, but it's what we had then. So technology is driving the problems we can solve, which is why when you get to a Google and AlphaGo Zero, where basically the system taught itself to be the world's best um, uh, player uh, of, gay, of Go, um, Amazingly, you see exactly the same architecture that Arthur Samuel invented in the 1950s. You know, we have the overall holistic board evaluator thing that he used rote learning for. You have the individual expert policies for the individual games. Rather than doing a alpha beta search, it's now doing a Monte Carlo tree search because you've got to go wider and deeper uh, and, and go, goes less predictable. Um, but, and, but the whole thing about the min-max strategy and the propagation of schools is still there. The actual thing's playing almost the same way that actually that checkers program was playing in the 1950s, but now everything's driven through a neural net. And then we get to today, where we've got things like GPT-3 um, and Project Abata. Project Abata you probably haven't heard of, because it lost. This is a computer that does Oxford debates, okay? And it does Oxford debates by ingesting a corpus, being given a subject to argue on, it will assemble its own argument, it will now speak its own argument. The, the human then responds, okay? It listens to the human, transcribes what the human says, and then generates a rebuttal to that argument. And then, basically, you, you, you have the full debate. Now, the reason no one's ever heard of this is because, as I said, unlike Deep Blue and unlike Jeopardy and everything else, we lost this one. Why? Because the human used emotion to sway the audience. Because the success of an Oxford debate is how many people you change the mind of. So it's a bit like Spock going up against Captain Kirk. You know, Spock is unlikely to win the argument for a big audience because Captain Kirk will now have to manipulate the audience. But this is important. In a, in a, in a world of, of deep fakes and, and, and manipulation through social media algorithms and, you know, implying hate by, by feeding back uh, the information that you will reinforce your own point of view and putting you into a small echo cave, we think this is the kind of technology that could, could go against that because it will show you both sides of the argument log logically, etc. Now, how you do that ethically, we don't know. That's up for debate. But that's where the technology is going. But that's got a really bad downside. So, as I said, every single time we get to a new inflection point of the technology, we open up new problems. But this is the problem we've got at the moment, uh, logarithmic graphs, yeah? So basically, um, we're doubling the amount of power we use for AI training every three and a half months. So I don't know about you, but I really don't want to burn the planet. Um, so we've got to find a way forward. And, and our, this includes GPUs and TPUs and everything else. So one thing is neuromorphic technology. Um, this is an old chart now, but you know, even if you updated it, all the, all the current pro systems would be clustered around here. Where do you think the human brain is on that chart? So this is clock frequency and power density. Up here, off the chart, somewhere on the wall. Ceiling, somewhere on the ceiling, afraid not. The human brain works at a really low clock speed, yeah, and uses almost no power. So wouldn't it be a cool idea if you actually had some chips that work that way. And we've been designing those, and you know, they're beginning to get to the point where in maybe five or 10 years, they might be commercially viable. Um, but this is used by the military primarily. Um, so on the right here, we've got an FPGA, yeah, for, which is basically shoveling video data at the chip on the left, called the True North chip. Uh, that chip, this is a thermal image obviously, um, is basically doing two and a half thousand frames of video processing and picking out the people and the vehicles uh, and, the and the cyclists and everything else, and it's doing that at 40 milliwatts, okay? So you can imagine you start scaling that, pro that, that, um, uh, that capability, it's amazing. And because the clock speed is so low, you can actually have huge wafers doing this, and you can string the wafers together in a supercomputer, which we have, and we've managed to create a supercomputer that uses about the same power as a human brain, um, with the, with the number of neurons and, uh, 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 of a mole, okay? So that's 
Not bad, at least we're in mammal territory. It's, it's you know, but, but that's one of the ways things are going to go. And the other way that's more immediate, you know, many of you will use GPUs for all kinds of reasons, I'm sure, um, as well as playing games. Um, but TPUs and, and, the, and, the other, and, the, and the other related technologies are coming through. And what we've found is that actually we can reduce the precision of the chips that we use um, to, to execute the deep neural nets to actually make them in massively more efficient, okay, without actually sacrificing much in the way of accuracy. So what you're going to see in, is, is basically this reduced precision digital, which may go down as far as, you know, two digits, you know, two bits. Um, and, and ultimately, we think it's going to end up with analog type chips. So as that goes through into 2026 and beyond, you know, just think of all those different steps I just showed you in the path to AI and machine learning. You know, I think the AGI um, path is, is opening up again because if we can make it this efficient, then we're not burning the planet. And in addition, things like the, the Watson, um, I didn't go through how the Watson Jeopardy thing actually worked, but the point is that it basically had huge numbers of algorithms and depending on the context, it was choosing different algorithms to answer which question and that's what it learned it had learned which algorithm works in which context. And I think that model that we're going to see much more of as we get into this stage of, of multi-machine learning. And bits, I won't spend very long time on bits because I don't have very much time at all anyway. Um, but the, the cool thing about bits is Moore's law is kind of dead. Well, it is dead. It's finished. It's gone. You know, the idea that processing power and, and power density would double every 18 months and you've got this ever... You know, exponential curve of, of glorious capability coming forward, it's finished, it's gone. Why? Well, because actually we're kind of running out of atoms. Um, basically, the, the current chips are now getting the size where well, they're so small that quantum effects are now beginning to dominate. So you have to redesign how gates work fundamentally to do that. But um, late last year, um, I think it was late last year, it might have been early this year, we announced two nanometer chips. So today's technology is about five to seven nanometers. Um, so you'll see that the, the density is about 90 to 170 transistors per millimeter squared. I still think that's amazing. Um, but then I grew up with machines that were in the megahertz, not the gigahertz and, you know, and the rest. Um, you know, now we are looking at, you know, this kind of thing, 24 atoms for a gate, and, and now 3D chip, chips are now increasingly 3D um, arranged so that they can get the density um, without having to go down to so small that things get compromised by the quantum effects. Um, the end result for the end user of this kind of technology, you know, we're still looking at things like either 75% power savings doing the same kind of work as today, which is good news for phones, I guess, um, or, you know, 45% power improvement. But you'll see, but that's going to be in five years' time, yeah, because that's how long it'll take to get from the basic fab to the device or thereabouts. So you can see that Moore's law genuinely has slowed down. And, you know, so even the world's second most powerful computer, which again is one of ours, you know, is not going to solve all the world's problems. And that's where we think qubits come in. Okay? Because qubits give us the ability to go into a whole bunch of new problems and new problem spaces that actually science and technology haven't even scratched the surface of. So what are qubits? Well, you know, I was, I was inducted into this space about five years ago now um, by going off to the labs and seeing everything and being, you know, taught how they worked and everything else and showing them. Um, and back then it really did feel like this is where we were, you know, Colossus and, you know, 1944 and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I'm not saying we're not, but we've come an awful lot way in, in, in the last five years. Um, but we're still right at the beginning of this, yeah? But we are looking at a, at a capability, you know, Moore's law coming to its end. We're now seeing something that is actually going well beyond Moore's law in terms of how fast we're making progress with the technology. Um, and, you know, so quant sorry, quantum volume is, is a measure, QV is a measure of how fast quantum computers are. And, and you can see that it's, it's going forward at, a, at a quite a rate of knots. Here's me showing off in front of a bunch of, uh, bunch of journalists on Monday. I think it was Monday, might have been Tuesday, this week. Um, basically, the thing that is crucial to know about quantum computers is that's the chip there. 
Okay, that tiny little thing at the bottom, postage stamp size, is the chip. All of this is just there to keep it cold. So at the top of the device, it's about four Kelvin, yeah? At the bottom of the device down here, when it's cold down, it takes 24 hours to cool down, it's about 14 millikelvin, okay? So significantly colder than outer space, about as cold as outer space. <laughs> um, and it needs to be that cold to keep the, co the qubits coherent. At the moment, you know, the only way to get a quantum computer to work is to keep these things under control um, on a supercomputer one, uh, sorry, on a, on a supercooled one. And basically, at the moment, we're about 600 microseconds of, of, of coherency before it all falls apart through to external factors. I mean, we're, you know, I think, I think we'll get to about a millisecond. And once we get to a millisecond, that's when we'll get the ability to do things that on a quantum computer that you know you can't do anywhere else. And the way it works at the, at the chip level is pretty extraordinary. I mean, you, you remember I've just shown you a two nanometer gate kind of technology, yeah? Look at the size of this Josephson junction, 100 nanometers. The chip technology that we're using kind of to do this is almost ancient. Yeah, because we're actually at that stage where we're, you know, we're actually using things that you can see with the human eye. And what's that, all you do with a quantum computer, in essence, is, is feeding in microwave signals to, to manipulate the qubits and then basically reading signals back out. And all those layers in the chandelier uh, that I showed you are all basically attenuation layers to make the signals less powerful as they come in and then amplify them as they come out so you can actually see what's going on in the machine. And this is what a quantum computer now looks like. They're rather cool, I think. And the, the system too looks even better. It's really nice. But even that, designed by the same people who designed things for Ferrari, I think it was. Um, but there's, a, there's an amazing, for those of you, some of you might know IBM, um, but IBM never does this. Okay, this is a three-year quantum roadmap that we published and we are sticking to. We never, you know, in research, we never stick out you know, roadmaps or whatever else. And the reason we've done this is because there's so much snake oil in the, in the quantum industry that we felt that we had to, you know, show what we were doing and be very open about it. So, you know, this is where we currently are with, with a 127 qubit machine. Um, and as you can see, what we're going to go, what we're going to move forward into very quickly next year is, is over 1,000 qubits. And we'll also at that point have the ability to essentially interact with the quantum machine using normal uh, Python libraries generally, yeah, using a serverless architecture. Today, if you play with the quantum computers in IBM, and you can play with them for free, by the way, you just log on and, and you can play with them um, and learn how they work. Um, it's a kind of batch mode orientation. You, know, you, you create your circuit, you define your circuit, you send it off, it runs 100,000 times, comes back, whatever. Yeah? Um, in this kind of time frame, we think we're going to have the big chips and serverless type architecture on the cloud. Why is that important? Well, we think that that combination of fast turnaround, interactive circuits that are both conventional and quantum, and that number of qubits, which allows us to do error correction on the machine, um, will be enough to get to quantum advantage. Okay, so we will be able to, to build algorithms that, you know, no supercomputer, no matter how big in the world, would ever be able to execute. Okay, and we think we probably will get there. We don't know. We hope next year. And that's real world problems, not just something theoretical made up. So, what is a qubit? What is what does it look like when you try and program a qubit? Well, a qubit is actually this thing on there. It can be either zero state or one state when it's measured. But before it's measured, it can actually have a value anywhere on the surface of this sphere if it's in a coherent state. And if it's in a coherent state, then your quantum computer's working. If it's not in a coherent state, it may well have a state inside the sphere, inside the block sphere, okay? But while it's working properly, it will have a value somewhere on the surface of the block sphere, okay? And this is actually a quantum program, all right? So a quantum circuit is a set of gates, similar to assembly code that you'd probably, well, I certainly used when I was a kid. Um, people don't tend to use assembly code anymore, but never mind. Um, but basically what this, this program is, this is two different qubits, qubit zero, qubit one. Um, these are C not gates. Every gate in quantum has to be reversible. You have to be able to do it both ways, yeah? Because um, you can't lose information. 
Um, so this is a C not gate. These are Hadamard gates that, that basically flip um, the phase of the uh, of the of the uh, of the quantum bit. Another C not gate, another Hadamard gate, another C not gate, and then these are the measurements. Now, when you measure it, you'll only ever get a zero or a one. But the point is that actually the value that you're getting might be somewhere over here. So if you run that whole thing lots of times, you get out probably a distribution curve that tells you more information than a single running would, which would just give you a zero or one. And the difference really between, you know, well, actually, I think I've just said that. Yeah, I've just said that. Um, so basically, um, you know, that's part of the power of a quantum computer, but not really the full story. Yeah. Um, and you get very simple gates like the, the X gate, which basically just revolves the vectors from zero state to one state, and you do put the X on it again, it will go back to the top. Very boring. But then you get things like the Hadamard gate. The Hadamard gate changes essentially the phase. So basically you start over here in the zero state, and you'll notice now the vector's pointing to the side. What does that mean? Well, what that actually means is you've now just invented Schrodinger's cat. Um, because this thing is literally half dead and half alive. And it's only when you measure it that it becomes one or the other. But it is genuinely in that state. And all the mathematics you can do and all the predictions you can do around the algorithms use this capability um, of superposition to enable you to start doing some clever things. And the really clever thing you can do with quantum is you can entangle quantum qubits together. So here we are on our 64-bit um, hummingbird chip. And we are untangling qubits 4 and 4 and 11 together. And what that means is when they're entangled, basically the states become, well, before we had two, two vectors, yeah? Uh, sorry, two, two, a two-dimensional vector, yeah? Now we've got a four-dimensional vector describing the individual qubit because they're now entangled. And you can't factor it out. Well, you can sometimes if they're, if they're in consistent states, but generally speaking, when, they, when you can't factor them out, they are then entangled. So they're entangled mathematically, but they're also entangled in reality. And we actually do that by firing a microwave pulse to both of the qubits at the same time that's at their joint harmonic frequency that actually kind of pulls them together. So basically, you know, this state is not entangled. And why not? Well, because we've got a zero here and a zero here when we could actually separate that qubit out. So it's only that qubit over here that's in a, in a, in a, in a bell kind of state. Whereas these ones here, you can't actually separate them out. These are now entangled. These two qubits are entangled. And why is entangling so important? Well, because every time you do that entangling, you add those extra two dimensions onto each individual qubit in the machine, okay, that's got an entangled qubit. So, you know, when you start with two qubits, you may be able to store the equivalent of 512 bits in this kind of phase memory space, multi-dimensional Hilbert space, or whatever you call it, yeah? But by the time you get down to these bigger numbers, and you know, remember we're somewhere between here and here at the moment, if you entangled all the qubits in that system and then use them to do some kind of problem, you're talking about somewhere between, you know, the equivalent of 550 gigabytes worth of state or more than all the atoms in the, in the Earth, okay? Now, that's not easy to do, but that's exactly how the algorithms work. You know, so you probably heard about Shaw's algorithm, yeah, uh, based on Grover's algorithm. Yeah, um, long way to go until that's a problem for you know 2K or 4K RSA keys. Yeah, but you know the, the possibility still remains that at some point in the future, maybe it's in 20, maybe it's in 30 years, that actually we will be able to, or someone will be able to execute you know, Shaw's algorithm and, and, and extract those keys, um, even at those kind of key lengths. Now, that's a bit scary, and it should be scary, because if you're holding data now that is valuable in 20 or 30 years' time, that's a problem. And we do have clients who are in that space, okay? So we've already made, you know, we're already going through and getting them to turn to elliptical curve cryptography and all this kind of stuff as a result. Um, but in fact, no one really knows whether these new NIST or ISO key schemes are actually going to be secure against quantum. Um, when I started quantum five years ago, I was told the traveling salesman problem was not amenable to quantum computer speed up. We now know that it is. 
So although we think the walk through a, a lattice may be perfectly fine at the moment, who knows? So I think another thing to think about, another thing to, to be talking to clients about, is they're going to need to have the ability to dynamically change their key schemes in the future. Yeah? Because when somebody comes up with one of these things, you know, there's nothing much you can do other than switch the key scheme. Yeah? And if that takes you months or years, that's not a good place to be. So I think you'll see dynamic cryptography scheme changes becoming an ever more increasing part of high security systems. So what can you do with this quantum stuff? You know, if you entangle all these qubits into this huge, amazing phase space that's got all these dimensions in it, you know, what does that enable you to do? Well, first of all, <laughs> the reason why quantum computers came around in the first place is Richard Feynman basically said, if you want to understand quantum systems, and there's quite a lot of reasons to understand quantum systems, you better actually have a quantum computer because it's the only thing that will cope with that problem. Yeah? If you want to, to model even something as simple as a caffeine molecule today on a supercomputer, you can't do it because the supercomputer isn't powerful enough. All right. So if we want to understand the real world down at the quantum level, we're going to need those machines. And I'll show why that's important in a moment. In AI, there's a whole pile of, of, of you know, you can't do the kind of big data kind of mining stuff. But for one shot kind of, or, or relatively small amounts of training type machine learning models, you know, you can start looking at these kind of things. And, and I've got, you know, on, on Monday we announced a, a deal with HSBC, you know, they're going to, over the next three years, are going to build out this capability and look at some of these kind of uses. Um, I've already, you know, we've already had the front page of Nature once, just on, on our machine learning classification capability on quantum. Um, it comes back with answers for really horrible classification problems, the like of which you've never seen before. Every other algorithm we've got in the world is going to be very procedural. You find the, the local minima, you try and work out if there's local minima or not, you know, da, da, da. But in quantum, it just does one kind of glance across the entire entangled space. It's over there. Slight oversimplification, but basically that's what it's doing. So the, even the answers it comes back with to machine learning classification problems look strange. They look kind of quantum. And then basically the Monte Carlo side of things, although this isn't exponential speed up like Shaw's algorithm, um, you know, this is at least, these are generally quadratic speed up problems. So we can still, it still means we can tackle stuff that the bigger supercomputer wouldn't have been able to tackle, you know, as soon as we get to the point of quantum advantage. Okay, so pretty broad ranging. Um, and if you want to play with them, you know, these are the quantum computers that are available at the moment. Uh, in the last five years or so, we've had 54 different quantum computers on the web um, for free, free for people to use. I think 20 of them are out there at the moment as we retire some and this kind of thing. Um, you can go off and play with them. Uh, this is, uh, you know, so you can drill into the one and you can see what the, the layout of the machine is and, and what you can do with it. Uh, this is me playing with the quantum experience. Generally speaking, if you're trying to build anything complicated, you'll write the final version in Python using a library called Qiskit. But while you're trying to learn the algorithm or understand how it works, I'd recommend using this kind of technique where you've actually got the musical stave notation at the top here. And what you're essentially doing is, you know, is actually stepping through the algorithm gate by gate. Um, and, and for the, you know, this is, this is, this is Grover's algorithm. Um, I could only find online three bit versions, three qubit versions of it. So I wanted to write a four qubit version of it. And then that would allow me to work out do a five qubit version, et cetera. So this was me working that out. And as you can see, I've successfully identified the, uh, uh, the, the right answer by kicking it out of phase. And then basically I've put it through the amplification process over here. And that's resulted in the probability of that answer coming out of the quantum computer being very close to, what, 80%? Is that? Yeah, it's pretty high. But you can see that compared to all the other states that it might have been the answer, it's, it's pretty obvious that it's found the right answer. And this is with, you know, noisy intermediate uh, scale quantum computers, you know, once we get error correction in here with more qubits, um, it'll make it even better. And the other thing I'm particularly proud of IBM for doing is, is making this process open. So if you want to go in and have a look on those computers and actually find out what the gate fidelity is for a CNOT gate on the latest Eagle chip, we'll actually tell you. 
and we're literally publishing everything. Why are we doing that? Well, because we think it's the only way to get this thing to work in a fast time frame. So, for example, we published a paper um, on quantum amplitude, quantum, amplitude, uh, quantum amplitude estimation, QAE. Yeah, and then basically two of our customers who are on our and a university who are on our quantum network, you know, they get to use our machines for research purposes, improved the method, yeah? And then JP Morgan Chase, the bank, um, worked out how to apply that to options pricing. <laughs> they, can't, they can't do it quite yet. They won't run quite yet. Um, but then basically we took what they'd done and put it back into QuizKit, which, and we start again. Yeah, so this kind of open approach to, to research and to, and to pushing the thing forward is, I think is really, really important, and it's why I think IBM is in a very strong position, um, not just with the hardware, which is our hardware, unlike many people, um, but also with this software ecosystem that's, that's really kind of building momentum. And why is it important? Why do I care about qubits, and why do I spend my time learning this stuff, um, apart from the fact that it's absolutely deeply fascinating? Um, well, mostly because these are the kind of things we think we'll be able to tackle. Yeah? So, I live up in Teesside, uh, sorry, down in Teesside, oh, sorry about that, I live down in Teesside, um, where two of the nitrogen fixation plants are for the UK, we make the fertiliser for Europe. Uh, that process takes one, worldwide, not just in Teesside, takes one and a half percent of the world's energy supply to, to make the fertiliser that keeps everybody alive because actually we can't create enough food without fertilizer, without this process. The harbour wash process is incredibly inefficient. It requires massive pressures and massive temperatures to work. Imagine if you could work out the enzyme that plants use to do exactly the same job, and then turn that into a catalyst. Yeah? You need to be able to model that molecule really, really with massive fidelity, but it's only got about 150 atoms in it which is well within the range of what's going to be, we hope, quantum computing in the next few years, okay? Or even better, perhaps, you know, the same kind of thinking. Can you create a catalyst for industrial use that basically takes the CO2 that comes out of industrial, um, as industrial waste and convert that into hydrocarbons using water? Because then you might be able to create something like methanol, which would be quite nice, because then you could fly planes with it. So actually, again, not only does that carbon capture, but it also produces a renewable fuel source, potentially. Yeah? But again, you can't do that unless you understand at a deep level how the, how, how the molecular chemistry is working. And at the moment, that's beyond supercomputers. Obviously, the financial models. And perhaps even new classes of antibiotics. Um, but I think just those first two were the ones that really got me interested, especially that top left one, because it's so near to my home and my heart. So, in summary, <laughs> and hopefully to give us two minutes for questions, um, we've not run out of problems in the world. We really haven't. But we do think that things like analog chips and, and, and machine learning models and deep neural nets and quantum and the kind of things I've just shown you may be useful, but we could genuinely use the help. All right. So thanks for your time. Any questions if we have time for questions? I know I'm between you and the bar. <laughs> Any questions? Please. What makes quantum encryption different from other techniques? Yeah, so I mean things like lattice encryption and this kind of thing. Basically the 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 the, the shortest walk problem through a lattice is, is just something at the moment that we can't find a quantum algorithm to implement that enables us to achieve any kind of speed up of any real nature. You know, most quantum algorithms either do a quadratic or an exponential speed up. Trouble is, in RSA, it's an exponential speed up um, using, using Shaw's algorithm. Um, and, and basically, the, um, you know, the symmetric, multi, you know, symmetric keys are, are a quadratic speed up, so not as bad. But, but so at the moment we haven't found the equivalent algorithm for lattice-based um, cryptography. Now, <laughs> do not quote me on this, but I look at it and go, you know, and I look at things like the traveling salesman problem where I was told there was no, no way to, st and now I find that there's a quadratic speed up for it. I don't know. That's why I'm 
I'm saying to all of you, think about how you create dynamic cryptographic schemes where you can swap out one scheme for another without too much hassle. Because I think that's where we're venturing into. It's only my personal opinion, not IBM's opinion, but that's, you know, uh, you know, we, we genuinely don't, you know, we hope those schemes are right, we think they are, but we don't actually genuinely know. How can we, you know? Yes. <laughs> right. The reason it's called post quantum is because you know if if we get quantum advantage next year, yeah, that doesn't mean we're going to be able to do Shor's algorithm at any size or any way, yeah. So it's not it's not a problem, yeah. But but in thirty years' time, it would be a problem. So you've got to have post-quantum cryptography now to protect the secrets that are going to be valuable in 30 years' time. Yeah? So, so that's why it's called post-quantum, because once quantum works at that kind of speed on those kind of keys, which might take 30 years, but you see, five years ago, we'd have said 50 years. <laughs> and some people are saying less than that, you know. Um, so that's why post-quantum is called post-quantum, because it's... It's what you need to do to be safe once quantum computers work. But again, I reiterate my previous comment. We're right at the start of quantum. We don't really necessarily know everything it can do yet. In fact, I'd be gobsmacked, frankly, if we did know everything it could do yet. Because fundamentally, underneath all those algorithms I showed you, there's only about really four or five fundamental techniques that we're using for all those algorithms. They all build on top of one another in some way. So, yeah, early days. But does that help answer the question? Yes, absolutely. I mean, but this is the problem, is that people will say today, oh, we've had a breach, but it's okay, everything was encrypted, yeah? I mean, I know that's not what, you know, as security consultants and everything else we'd like to hear, but it, that's happening every day. Now, most data isn't going to be valuable in 30 years' time, but some is. Very small proportion is, but some is. So, you know, that's why, that's why I say these things. You know, yes... You, want, you don't want people to be able to walk off with large amounts of data, even encrypted data. Um, but people do. Uh, well, I, I, I'm not the person to say, but, you know, um, if you've got um, some kind of legal documents that would be highly embarrassing, if you've got intelligence that would be highly embarrassing and still valuable if it was released in 30 years, you know, it's those kind of things, you know, and, and some companies, of course, you know, have got contracts that last for 30 years that they need to find some way to secure to make sure they haven't been interfered with. You know, so it's, it's those kind of things that, that, you know, it's a very small proportion. But, of course, you know, that's the kind of area that IBM deals with day in, day out. You know, we don't deal with, you know, the SMEs or the small companies. We deal with the regulated industries and the people who have got that kind of data. Please. Oh, that's a good question, isn't it? That's an excellent question. Given it, given infinite time, there's, there's, the quantum computer isn't doing anything that a that a supercomputer couldn't do with infinite time. Yeah, you know, there's nothing. There, well, there is something magic about them. Because <laughs> no one actually knows how they genuinely work. So we know the maths. We can get them to work. We can get them to do sums. We can run programs. We can reset everything. You know, we, we've got them working with really good computers now. Yeah? But actually, you, you asked two or three levels down of the question of, yeah, but how does superposition work? And, and why does entanglement do that? And, and why is it only when it's mathematically separate does it become really entangled? And literally, everybody looks and goes, we don't know. 
you know, multi universities. We don't know. There's, you know, there's there's a myriad of different explanations out there how these things work, but no one knows. So it's so even though we don't know how it's working down at that level, what we do know is that it is following a kind of predictable and even though it's inherently random, but the way it works is inherently random, we're using it to, to perform repeatable problems. You know, it's just that each time you run it, you never know you're going to get the same answer. Um, but, but you run it a lot of times and you start finding out you've got the right answer. You know, it's, so, yeah, so yes, I don't think it violates Turing's idea at all. It's just that, how, you know, it, it would take a long time to solve some of these problems. Longer than the lifetime of the universe so far, probably. Any other questions? I know I'm definitely between you guys and beer, so um, I'm not expecting that. I wasn't expecting even that many, so thank you. Okay. <laughs> And I think I might be coming to the hotel. I'm not sure, but I, but, I, but is it um, the after dinner just thing? On that point, oh, <laughs> right. Um, so that brings us to the end of this year's the Tour de Hack Conference Day. I'll see. I'm sure some of you tomorrow for the CTF day. And I also want to say, if any of you guys don't have the after party bands yet and you want to go to the after party, I think Richard, you managed to miss yours. Um, come see one of the committee members at the doors, just stay behind and we will sort you out for that. Um, thank you all for a great talk. I want to say a huge thank you to our helpers and speak, some of which are still next door, still helping, some of which are still here helping. Um, huge thank you to the committee. You've made it a lot easier for me. Um, huge thank you to our speakers. Huge thank you to you guys. Huge thank you to Cooper, who provides the cameras and the rigs for all of these. Uh, it's all right. Uh, <laughs> um, huge thank you to Cooper, who, supply, who supplies the rigs for all of these um, conferences. And if you want to show him support, he's got a link um, on his Twitter bio to his website where you can buy him some beer. And... On that subject, guys, I want you to take just two things away from today. I hope you remember something that you learned today and you forget something you do tonight, right? Make sure you drink responsibly, look after yourselves, and have a good time. Thank you to the sponsors as well. Um, yeah, if I could make out what was on my radio, that would have been a lot easier. Huge thank you to all the sponsors, of course because the sponsors really, really made this happen and paid for a bar tab. <laughs> <laughs>